Our lesson this morning is a tough one. There's a number of troubling issues of the story laid with a sense of foreboding regarding the cross, Jesus' dark, scary death. Jesus' soul, we're told, is troubled by it. And he even tells a troubling proverb about seeds needing to fall to the earth and die before they can bear fruit. And we know what Jesus is about to face, and even knowing that Easter is on the other side of his looming crucifixion, this lesson jars us. Jesus was fully human, and so he experienced that frightening situation as we might imagine a human would. And Jesus' proverb is counterintuitive since we are all hardwired to love life. And as a part of that hardware, we pretty much reject the notion that death and darkness can lead to anything good, let alone fertilize much fruit. And while it's one thing to claim that when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, it's altogether different to claim a dark thing like a wrongful execution can fertilize and help sprout any. And this is especially so when we take into account Jesus and his followers knew he was talking about the terrifying reality of a crucifixion. To imagine that something good can ever come from it causes our souls to be troubled to the core of our being. It is upsetting. How can evil fertilize and help sprout? But the reality is through Jesus' loving way and teachings and life, the evil of his crucifixion somehow fertilized and sprouted the good of its continuing influence and experiential reality. Easter came out of death. And not because God wanted Jesus' death, but because the evil of it brought into focus the very love that it sought to snuff out. And so love was fertilized and sprouted and has continued to grow and bear much fruit. And Christianity has long related all of this to the ancient story of the fabled phoenix, a bird that rises out of ashes. I often refer to the phoenix in our Ash Wednesday service. A more modern but similar image is diamond. But Jesus' proverb in our lesson catches it even better. Had he not been killed by Rome for preaching love, and then have his love experienced after his death, it's not like the multitude of good that has sprouted from it would have occurred. In retrospect, we can claim as Jesus does that because he lived his life as a seed of love. When he died, that seed sprouted and continues to sprout much, much. Fruit. At one level, these images of transformation, and even today's lesson, are attempts to make, uh, make to help us make the best out of bad situations. And much of the Bible has that wisdom in it. And the book of Job is perhaps the best example where Job, a good and righteous man, has numerous awful things happen to him. And so we know lack of goodness did not cause the bad things to happen to him. We're told he's the most righteous man there was. There's something else to take away. Well, well Job was clearly written to reject the theology that bad things only happen to bad people. Well, the author of Job still had to provide an answer to resolve what to do about bad happenings. Everyone faces them in life, a lot of them. And the book of Job's resolution is essentially that we need to make the best out of what happens to us. In short, we are called to make phoenixes out of ashes, diamonds out of coal, and fruit out of dying seeds. And our, our lesson today echoes this ubiquitous Bible lesson of a divine call for us to move toward the best in our given situations, even, maybe especially, the hardest and most dire situations. And this will sound heretical to some Christians, but I believe this can be heard as similar to the Darwinian idea that creatures survive by best adapting to 
to meet challenges in creation. And while Darwin was referring to genetic evolution over generations, science evidences we are hardwired to do our best to survive instinctively in each moment of life, not just genetically, through the ages. Job's lesson. And the lesson implicit in the phoenix and the diamond and the Dead Sea metaphors is that we are called to betterness out of every hardship. Hardship can fertilize and sprout the fruit of better ways, better us, better communities, better world. And this doesn't mean that God wants or causes bad things to happen. God is not tossing lightning bolts of badness to get us to hop to better. What it means is that the laws of nature of creation are such that challenges, small and great, are a part of living, natural, and human-made calamities happen. Earthquakes, tsunamis, disease, gravity, age, accidents, human failings by us and by others. They all add to a landscape of life that is fraught with peril and calamity. Survival depends on best responses. And life, life, of course, is more than peril and bad things happening. Natural and human beauty and goodness also abundantly occur. And actually, out of peril and bad things, goodness can be fertilized and sprouted. That is one layer of what Jesus' fruit from the dying seed proverb is about. And really, if you think about it, much of the Bible is about that. The Bible is mostly about our trying to be in relationship with God and creation and each other in ways that literally make the best out of everything that comes our way, be it good or bad. To say the obvious in life. We get how it helps us in relationships. It's the difficult things that we not only dislike, but have a hard time seeing how to sprout good fruit out of. So my way of thinking, religion is a Darwinian-like survival tool, one means through which humans have evolved and continue to evolve to fruitfully survive peril and difficult happenings to make good out of them, alone and corporately together. And our story today from the book of John was penned well before the age of reason and dark, and nonetheless the story has a very kind of wisdom in, in it, as does the book of Job and, and much of the Bible. Indeed, we can find this wisdom in Jesus' teachings in general, in the gospel accounts of his followers, amazing ability to experience Jesus and Jesus' way to be resurrected from Rome's brutal efforts to crush them upon the cross. Out of negative things, as bad, as brutal, and destructive, and death, we can fashion good. God does not desire bad happenings, but when they happen, God desires we make the best out of them, and the best always aims toward good. But Jesus' proverb and his crucifixion is understood by early Jesus followers actually take the make good out of bad call a, a quantum leap further. Jesus claims in the proverb that the death of the seed must happen. It must happen for some types of fruit to be born. And the book of John can be heard in our lesson to be pointing out that the lasting and continuing goodness of Jesus' life in the Christian story would not have borne fruit for the angels without it. His dying. And the big picture of this can be heard to retrospectively mean that Jesus had to die in order for the fruit of his resurrection to occur. And there's obvious truth in that, not because God willed it, but because without Jesus' death, his followers did not know they could continue to experience him and pass him and his way on, and that both would continue to shine so bright for eons and eons. This 
has no lens of very questionable theology like the idea that Jesus was sent by God to be intentionally sacrificed, to appease God as a part of a cosmic plan for Jesus' life to bear fruit. Or the idea that humans in turn must believe that and then wait to die before they are able to get the fruit of their belief and have it. But these theologies were developed long after Jesus died and John was written. The theology of the cross in the gospel need not be understood that way. Jesus' proverb recorded in our lesson reflects the truth that the negative of Jesus' death bore the potential to fertilize and sprout positive fruit after his life. And we know that fruit has indeed been fertilized in part by his death and has grown and multiplied and multiplied for 2,000 years. But that doesn't mean God desired or demanded or wanted the negative. It means on one hand that like Job's lesson, out of negatives we are called to our best. But it also means on the other hand, as Jesus suggested, negatives bear fruit that cannot be born without them. Here's one simple example. Crucifying was a common means of execution in Western Europe. It was such a terrible thing that early Christians did not use the cross as a symbol of the faith because it only had deeply negative, terrifying connotations. But that often brought to light in Jesus' death fertilized the fruit of humaneness that resulted in the demise of the government use of the cross. It's no longer a legal means of execution and terror. And while that is a matter of history, we can argue theologically, as the feasting on the word commentary generally seems to, that Jesus' death on the cross exposed the systemic evil of crucifying people and served to exercise that dark spirit from creation, it's no more. God in humanity judged the cross too cruel to inflict on others. And by God, I mean love. And by love, I mean God incarnate in the hands and the feet and the voice and the ears of humans. The primary characteristic of God is love. And love is the desire for others' well-being, which is another way to say the desire for what is best for us and others. And creation. And we can see this in even bigger system-wide issues like poverty and slavery, child labor, racism, misogyny, and heterosexism. Through love, those evil things have fertilized and sprouted the good fruit of concerted efforts to end them. And I've mentioned Darwin a few times already, hoping that we are hearing the desire for well-being as another way to say adapting to best survive, adaption for well-being. That is, love can bear God's fruit without evil. But in a Darwinian-like sense, evil threats to the well-being of humanity can cause the fertilizing and the sprouting of good fruit. That's Jesus' metaphor. And to switch metaphors, it's as if every time the evil spirits of human action threaten well-being, the desire for well-being, love, agitates evil like dirt in laundry, making it show itself so that love can wash it out and rinse it down a cosmic drain. Using spiritual language, devil spirits are exercised by love because love always aims for well-being and the devil's never, ever about well-being. And once exposed, love can flush evil spirits out and away. And that's true whether we think the devil or Satan are real beings or metaphors for dark forces that can drive human action to create unwell being for others, for creation. The devil is the force that desires unwell being for others. God is the force that desires well being for all. And this sounds complicated, which is a part of why the cross of Jesus' death is so packed with complex and contradictory theologies. But what we can hear Jesus' proverb and its application to his death boil down to is that humankind instinctively desires to better itself in relation to creation and the force that created, created and that instinct. Can 
been fertile ground for fruitful change. The force that created us, the one we call God, unceasingly beckons us to better. When we learn of people, we can think of as desires for non-well-being of others, we are wired to want to stop it because love is at the core of our soul. Our soul is troubled by non-well-being, not just ours, but others and all creations. We want well-being for others, for us, for creation. But want is not action, nor does one by one coordinate action by others. Jesus is a vehicle for prompting and coordinating love and action by individuals and by groups. And while he was alive, Jesus taught his followers alone and together to want love and be love in action. He showed them and us a loving way to stop and make the best of whatever hurts us, whatever hurts others, what other, whatever hurts creation. And Jesus' teaching got him killed on a cross by evil forces, those that desire a non-well-being of others. In any way we look at it, something remarkable occurred after Jesus' death. Jesus' followers at first thought Jesus and his way were stopped dead. The miracle is they eventually realized Jesus and his way of love sprouted the fruit of their own continuing existence. Eventually, they also realized it was ironically and miraculously fertilized by Rome, bringing it to light in the darkness of its efforts, of their efforts to snuff it out. You see, evil can fertilize the growth of love, and evil does not and cannot and never will stop the fruit of love. Here's the good news of our lesson in one sentence. Love grows when we act to stop evil. Love grows when we act to stop evil.